Hey, it's um, <clears throat> my great pleasure to be here, uh, to be some small part of this event. Before I talk about what I was going to talk about, though, I can't help but um, think back to that Indiana Jones uh, moniker I was given by the Wall Street Journal. And it probably says something sad about me that it was one of the high points of my career. Uh, and for two weeks, I floated around thinking of myself as the Indiana Jones of economics. And then I was at a cocktail party, and my then wife, we're no longer married, uh, was talking to another woman. And I don't think they knew I was within earshot. And the other woman said to her, you know, what does it feel like to be married to the Indiana Jones of economics? And my wife thought about it and she said, Indiana Jones? I think Jim Jones would have been a more apt comparison. <laughs> so, uh, all right, so <clears throat> I get asked to do, I don't know, roughly a, a hundred events like this a year, and this is the only one I accepted. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm extremely selfish, uh, and I guard my time, but uh, I have a long history with Pratham, and, uh, and I, I can't be happier about being here, and the people I've met today, it's been fantastic. Uh, I'm not, however, gonna try to give you a speech about how, about how great the organization is, because you already know that, and many of you know the organization better than me. Uh, you'll hear from the other speakers. Uh, but I thought maybe in comparison, I should talk to you about my own uh, attempts to make a difference in the world. And, um, and when you see how incredibly ineffective I've been over and over and over, by comparison, you might begin to appreciate even more what Pratam has uh, managed to do uh, in their time. So my first attempt to make the world a better place happened uh, in about 2009. And uh, I got together with a couple other uh, well-known academics, some Nobel Prize winners, and we thought that um, a really sensible way to try to make the world a better place would be to start with the billionaire philanthropists who were giving money away but seemingly in very ineffective ways, in ways that weren't making a very big difference. And our view is that by taking the best kind of ideas from academics and the best business practices, you could take that money and, and triple or quadruple the impact it was having. And it seemed like a completely natural way to make a difference. And um, because it was, it was not long after Freakonomics had come out and it was actually surprisingly interested, uh, surprisingly easy to get to the billionaires. And so we would sit down and we would talk to them tell them what we wanted to do. And we didn't, want, didn't even want to charge that much money. We wanted to charge a little bit of money, but mostly we just wanted to try and make their money go further. And it turned out that we had essentially two conversations. So I don't know, I'd probably talk to between 15 and 20 billionaires. Uh, and we had one of two conversations. The good conversation went like this. We would give them this field and they'd say, that all sounds really interesting. But tell you what, what I really need is I need you to make me more money in my business, okay? After you make me more money in my business, then let's go back and talk about how to, how to make the charity go further, okay? And after probably seven or eight times this happened, we sat down as a partner and said, well, maybe we're in the wrong line of business. And even though our company was called The Greatest Good, we ended up doing consulting to like the biggest, most successful companies in the world because we would talk to the owners and they had no interest in, in us helping with their philanthropy, but they did want us to make more money and they're willing to pay us two, three, four times as much to make the money in the business as they would have been willing, would, they were willing to pay literally zero to, to help with the philanthropy. The other conversation we had, which was really amazing to me, and this was about half the time, was uh, they'd say, look, I know I donated all this money, okay, but it's just the price of doing business in the modern world. I mean, there's so much pressure and everyone gets mad at you, but I don't care. Like, I got all the credit when I donated the money, when I put the money into the foundation, okay, and I got the headlines. And now, you know, really all I care about is, you know, being invited to the right parties and this and that, and you know, it doesn't really matter to me where my money goes or how it happens. Okay, and that was shocking and discouraging. That happened about half the time. The only silver line we ever had was, I think this was our exact last, maybe our 16th conversation. It was with a, a German heiress of a really big industrial company. And we sat down, we, you know, by now our pitch was somewhat deflated and not with the same kind of optimism it once had. And we gave her her pitch and she said, you're hired. 
And we're like, really? And, and he said, well, what would you like us to work out? And she said, I only care about one issue, and that's equal rights for animals. And I said, well, what do you mean? She says, I think animals should have equal rights as people have. And I said, do you mean the house pets or, or farm animals or wild animals? She said, all of them. Okay? And I said, so you mean like, like voting? And <laughs> she's like, yes. Okay? And I was so desperate that I sat in that room quietly for about five minutes and I said to myself, could I possibly find a way to work for equal rights for animal voting? <laughs> And I finally said, I'm really sorry. I don't think I can help you, but I, maybe I can find you someone else who would want to help you. And that was officially the end of uh, phase one of my attempts to, uh, to make the world a better place. So phase two actually came in 2011. And I had been invited to India to give a speech in New Delhi at you know, one of the super fancy uh, events that was going on to, to super elites, and I did it, but uh, I've always been really interested in, in seeing different, you know, different parts of, of how people live. And so I um, put out a call on my blog saying, is there anyone who you could recommend that might be able to show me um, the, the slums around Delhi? And somebody said, um, for sure the people you want to do it with are Pratham, okay, and I'll put you in touch with them. And, uh, and so a guy named Shayak Banerjee, who had been a Stanford uh, engineering undergrad and had decided he wanted to give something back, was working for the organization. And I met him, and he took me around. And it was um, really a, a life-changing day for me. It was, um, you know, I, I saw some of the most horrendous things I've ever seen, a man who'd been burned all over his body with flies landing on him and his wife trying to, to, to use a, a, like a palm frond or something to keep the flies off of him. Uh, it had happened because he had, they'd gotten locks on their, in their, their house, and, um, and they cooked inside the house, and a fire had broken out, and they couldn't get out because of the locks and whatnot. Uh, it also, you know, it was, if you've experienced it, it's the, the life in the slums in India is, is really... Um, it, it, it's just, it's hard to put words to it. It's, it's uh, so difficult, um, so challenging, and yet somehow governed by a, a kind of civility that is really um, unexpected when you've, say, visited the Chicago South Side and experienced what inner cities of the United States are like. And, and this particular uh, slum had an enormous sanitation problem. Uh, it, it was, um, I, I don't know what the formal word is uh, for outdoor defecation. It's like there was essentially no, uh, no facilities for anyone. And I came back and I spent the next two years um, trying to work on various solutions, various ideas I had related to that problem. And they related to, yes, we, you don't care what the ideas were. It doesn't matter what the ideas were. The ideas probably weren't that good. But I talked with ideas, I talked to everyone I could and tried to convince anyone to work with me and never made any progress. I mean, everyone's happy to talk about it, but uh, you know, maybe because the idea wasn't that good or, or maybe because an idea in and of itself doesn't win the day. And, uh, and so those two years ended up changing exactly zero lives. Okay? In the meantime, Pratam was out there changing millions of lives year by year by year. Um, stage three of my attempt to uh, make the world a better place uh, actually came, I had officially retired from making the world a better place after my uh, phases two and one, one and two, but, uh, but one of my former students, Anup Malani, uh, who was now a professor at the uh, University of Chicago Law School, had managed to do something that I had never managed to do, which was to convince a big foundation uh, to sponsor a project of his, and it was a big Indian foundation, and he had worked out a deal where they and IDEO, the Silicon Valley idea firm, were going to, uh, Anoop and my only job was to um, come up with problems, which would then be funded by uh, this foundation, and they would be crowdsourced 
to get great ideas to solve the problems through audio. Okay, you didn't, we didn't need any answers. All we needed to find were problems. Okay, and uh, so this sounded fantastic. And I even decided that the right thing to do would be not just to go myself to the Mumbai slums where we were gonna go and do field research, but I brought my two 17-year-old, 16-year-old daughters who had lived very much a life of privilege in the United States, uh, and I wanted them to come with me and help come up with ideas uh, and, and see what it was like. And we probably are the only three American tourists who've ever flown uh, to India for three days and spent like 90, except for our sleeping hours, 90% of time trudging through, you know, ankle deep water in the, in, in the slums of Mumbai as the, you know, the monsoons were coming down. And again, it was an amazing, amazing experience. And um, what I'd learned by then was uh, it's so important for my first visit. I'd been a few times in between, but my first visit was how important it was to be with, to, to, to go around with people who knew it who, who knew what they were doing. And, and so I had managed to befriend uh, one of a, a slum dweller in a previous trip to Mumbai. And so he had arranged to take me through his slum and, and friends in other slums. And we really, we got to go into people's houses and talk to them and, and really understand what their situation was. And so through this trip, we, uh, saw, we saw a whole range of issues that were important. And, and um, one of the problems that we identified was uh, related to English. It just, it, it seems completely clear, to me at least when I was there, that if you could speak good English, you had a chance. And otherwise you had no chance. So let me just step back for a second. And I think what's, what I've, what I've, what only slowly dawned on me, I've always had this view, at least when I was younger, that had I grown up in a different setting, I somehow would have fought my way to some really good outcome, okay? And having spent time now in the, in the slums in, in Delhi and Mumbai, I know for sure that it's just a complete illusion, that um, anyone who, who, who looks at that and thinks, oh, you know, that would have been no problem for me. I would have been the one who overcame, and I would have been the one who studied and didn't. I think it's completely unrealistic. And it's really amazing, I think, uh, growing up privileged in America, to, to think about, um, so for instance, two of my daughters were adopted from China and, um, and their lives were so transformed by moving, you know, by, by, you know from, from being orphans in China to, to growing up in the United States. Uh, one of those daughters was with me in, in India and I think it had a very profound impact on her. Um, but so we, one thing was clear is that um, learning English, speaking English, is a, 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 not a, I don't want to imply it's a path to success, but it gives you some teeny tiny chance at success. And yet as we went from school to school and talked to the English teachers, they didn't actually speak English. The English teachers couldn't teach the kids English because the English teachers didn't know English themselves. Okay, and so that became one of the, 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 the problems we posed to the foundation is how could you create a device, and um, I, I don't know this, this prodigy thing that was um, talked about, but something like a device that would allow a self-starting kid to maybe have some chance to, to learn English. The other one that we really became acutely aware of is that some of the worst conditions of, of all exist in the, um, for construction workers. So construction workers are itinerant. They move from place to place. They don't have the same kind of family structure around them. And consequently, they live with their families on construction sites in the most makeshift um, of all um, surroundings with the, the worst sanitation. And it, it, and it seemed to us that was a problem that, that could be solvable because the, you know, the construction, in, in principle, if you actually gave construction workers decent housing, you might think it would improve their productivity enough that it could pay for itself. So it seemed like a good kind of problem uh, to pose. So we went back to the foundation with our problems and um, to my amazement, they said, well, you know, um, the construction one, many of our donors, our biggest donors are construction firms. 
And I don't think, they, they wouldn't like this. This seems like a really bad problem. And we don't want to risk uh, offending them, so we don't want to pursue that project. And I mean, in my own naivety, naivety, I said, but we're talking about the worst off people. Yeah, but you know, we're talking about our donors, okay? It was, it was awful. And the, on the English, oh, that makes us really uncomfortable, the idea about English. That seems like a really bad idea. I think we should probably, this is the person at the foundation talking from an office on the 23rd floor overlooking you know, the most beautiful views of, of Mumbai. Uh, I think we should probably stop this whole project, the funding on this whole project. It seems like it's only going to be problematic. And it was really shocking to me because here was a group, a, a well-known foundation, who in the end, all they cared about was their own self-preservation. And it was shocking to me that, why would you bother? I mean, it's like kind of my reaction is, why would you, why would you bother? Um, and, you know, the only thing I think good that came out of this visit to the, to the slums and this, this trip was that my one daughter, my one adopted daughter, was so profoundly uh, affected by this trip that for better or worse, she decided she was never going to go to college and instead she was going to travel the world and be a world citizen. And uh, so I don't know if that was a good thing or not. I'm still, uh, the verdict's still out on whether that was a good thing or not. Okay, so all the time I was doing this, Pratam was out there helping another 3 million, 4 million, 5 million kids, okay? It is the hardest thing in the world to actually make change, to figure out, to take innovative ideas, like to partner with schools, but then to intensively work with kids outside of school time, to actually teach them stuff they've never managed to learn before. I mean, why would you think that would, why would you even, I wouldn't think that would work. I wouldn't think that if a kid hasn't learned anything in the first five years that you could take 30 days, but it turns out it works, okay? And then you go and do it, and, and then you, you come up with different programs, and you partner with you know, the best economists at, at, at JPAL, and you test these ideas, and you drop the ones that don't work, and you use the ones that do. Anyway, I think it's amazing. Uh, the, the amount of dedication that volunteers have put into this, um, the incredible ideas, the implementation, is just a miracle, okay? And, and I think it's true, there's so much more room. There's so much, there's so many more people that need help. So uh, look, I wish, I wish I could contribute uh, in some way to the world other than uh, being up here urging you, uh, uh, you know, recounting my failures and urging you to instead uh, back the horses that are really winning the races. But, uh, but that's all I got, and I couldn't be more delighted to have the opportunity to speak with you today and, uh, and wish only the best for this organization and, uh, and, and feel privileged to have a chance to talk. So thank you very much. Sure.